uh, California legislation, uh, Social Security, fairness, and then new federal legislation for weapon GPO. We have reports from some of the districts around the county and uh, then we'll have a discussion at the end. Hopefully we'll have about 10, 15, 20 minutes at the end to discuss any issues and questions we have. So I'm gonna get started right away. Uh, and as Arnie pointed out, we are recording the informational side of the meeting and then we go to the discussion and we'll stop recording so that everyone can have a record of what we're doing. First thing I wanna talk about is some California legislation. Um, actually, we're going to have Carol do an introduction of these two important bills for part-time faculty. Carol Whaley. Okay, I'll take it away. And also regarding the recording, uh, so please hold your questions to the end and we'll turn the recording off before we get to the question. Um, so updates on some California legislation that is impacting part-time faculty. Um, there is a lot of legislation happening, but there are two, two bills specifically aimed at part-time faculty uh, that are moving slowly right now. The first is AB 375, and that is to raise the, the load limit from 67% up to 85%, uh, meaning that we could all probably teach, uh, an, if we're, even if we're at the top, at the max, we could probably, most of us would be able to teach another class. Um, it's not, obviously it's not a perfect bill. We'd like to eliminate the, the, load, the load cap altogether, uh, but it is, uh, it is a good bill. It is a repeat of a bill from last year that was uh, AB 897 was exactly the same bill and it had passed the, it, it passed the full assembly, I think unanimously. However, COVID hit and basically all bills that were not related to, to helping with the COVID crisis were uh, uh, shuttled and so it, it went away. So it was reintroduced this year it passed the Assembly Higher Ed Committee uh, with a unanimous vote. And then it went to the Assembly Appropriations Committee, which is where they talk about, well, how much money is this gonna cost? And it was sent into the suspense file. And that was due mostly to an analysis by whoever does the analysis of how much it will cost. That basically said that, well, if you, if you make the districts pay uh, employ these adjuncts, to 85%, then the Affordable Care Act uh, law will kick in and make it so that they have to pay us uh, health benefits and that'll cost them so much. And so it was sent into, into suspense. That doesn't mean it can't get out of suspense, but it's a harder lift to get it out of suspense. Uh, the second bill is on pay parity. It's AB 1269, uh, introduced by Assembly members Christina Garcia and somebody, Santiago, uh, and this would is a bill that would require the chancellor's office to collect and report on part-time faculty parity data from each district, report the data as specified, the district would be required to report it on the internet, and then it would create a, a, a work group to define what parity means, meaning equal pay for equal work, and what does that mean, and then recommendations for how districts can achieve that in their compensation schedule by 2027. That was just heard in assembly uh, appropriate. It, it went to assembly higher ed, it passed with one dissenting vote uh, that, and then it was just heard in appropriations yesterday where it was sent into the suspense file because they don't know how much it will cost. And obviously it will cost quite a bit. Um, so I would urge you if you uh, want to know more about these bills, we'll be providing links to the bills and to the authors and to write to the authors and especially to the appropriations committee members urging them to pass this on, pass these on for full vote. Um, the more they can hear from us as part-timers and hear our stories, the more sway we will have. Um, I, the, the, the authors of the bills are very much in favor of them, obviously, but it's convincing, it's convincing appropriations and then eventually the whole assembly and then the Senate. 
uh, to pass. And I think that's what I have. Okay, thank you, Carol. We'll have more discussion on, on both of these rather controversial bills at the, at the end of today's meeting. Now we go from state, leg state legislation to federal legislation. And what we're watching is, our, we have there are two bills. One is House uh, Resolution 82, and the other is Senate Bill 1302, and they are both Social Security fairness bills. So it, I guess they just start in each house and start working on the same project till they meet in the middle and they all agree or something. Uh, but in any event, we are working very hard with the California Retired Teachers Association to help get HR 82, which will eliminate the windfall elimination um, P and the GPO. Uh, the, I'm sure you've all heard about them. The, the WEP really hurts people with low income and retirement. Um, it messed with me badly. And then the GPO is even worse if you are have spousal benefits. So because it hurts part-time faculty on our low retirement um, from STRS, we've really gone out of our way to try to get people to support it. So far, Sadafa has met with Scott Peters, Congressman uh, Scott Peters, who is a co-sponsor. And uh, he, he, we met with him face to face. That was quite impressive. Um, he was in San Diego or California at the time. So we got to meet with him. We talked about about an hour. It was a very nice visit and he was very supportive. We met with Sarah Jacobs, who was newly elected into the seat that was held by Susan Davis, who we also talked to on this. So you can see this is an ongoing process. So Sarah Jacobs was not available, but we talked to her staff and they were very, very uh, helpful. And they said, please contact us again with more information. And they also signed on. We have, we are trying to set up a date next week to speak with newly elected Daryl Issa, who's in East and North County. So if anyone uh, of you is in his district, please let us know. We'd love to have you join us for that meeting. We are trying to work to set up a meeting with Juan Vargas. We haven't made the contact yet, but if anyone is in his district, please let us know and we would be great, happy to work with you. They always like to have constituents in the parties joining them. <clears throat> That, so that was for HR 82. And what was just um, opened was uh, Senate Bill 1302, um, open on April 22nd, is a bipartisan bill, again, in the Senate to reintroduce the Social Security Fairness Act. And there's a link here, you can read about it. <clears throat> and as I said, I believe this is one of the original uh, Social Security Fairness Bills so they have been working on it for a long time and there's a lot of public feedback that they're not working fast enough and um, because it's, they've been talking about it for many, many years. So any support we can give, we'll be trying to send out updates on um, how to contact Congress members and uh, senators. So from that, we're going to go on to our reports. We have a group report from San Diego Community College District starting with Carlin Albi. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've been in several meetings over the past two weeks where this subject about what's gonna happen in the fall came up. And the answers, while they were specific to San Diego, State, uh, San Diego Community College District, several of the speakers referenced the other districts. Basically, it's still up in the air how much will uh, be back on face-to-face uh, -face next fall. Uh, there's a couple issues there. Being uh, conservative, my dean said they're going to bring back the lab classes, but the lecture classes probably will not be brought back yet. Um, another one said one of the constraints is if you bring the people back to teach, you have to have support staff and they don't know how much of the support staff is going to be available to come back. Um, my uh, department chair made the comment about the other college where he teaches, Point Loma Nazarene, and he also referenced San Diego State and, and uh, University of California. So it sounds like just about everybody's in the same boat. One of the rules has to do that they're all the colleges are 
and universities are facing is if the classes are quote unquote large lecture rooms like they have at the universities where you have 100 people in the room, which we don't have at the community college level, but the community college level may have to consider our classes that are at a cap of 45 to be a large lecture room. What I am suggesting to all of you now, keep in mind, I had no classes this uh, year at all. I'm contacting my dean to let them know I'm available. However, I have um, a not reliable internet, or you can see the reason for the picture. It's my camera doesn't work real well either. So um, I also sent in that email to my dean that I can only consider a face-to-face. -face. With it being understood, it's because of equipment constraints. Okay, so I'm advising everybody, make sure if you did not have classes, this year or this semester, make sure you tell your dean that you're still available because I'd hate to have it be out of sight, out of mind. Um, but it's all up in the air. They don't even know until the end of May, probably maybe even the beginning of June what the schedule is going to be like. Now, going into the next subject there, the AFT negotiated with San Diego Community College District about a $500 remote work stipend, a one time only. If you worked, meaning even the librarians or the counselors, or if you taught this school year, there you're gonna get a one time only $500 remote work stipend that's supposed to help compensate you for the additional costs that you have because you're teaching remotely. Um, People like me that didn't have any classes, it kind of leaves us out in the open because I had extra costs last spring, but that doesn't count. It has to be this school year. And um, AFT did send out the email to everybody. And I've also posted it on the Facebook page for San Diego adjuncts. And that's my report. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Carlin. Um, next, we have Arnie Schoenberg, who's going to be talking about POA. Arnie. So, and just to qualify this for, for some of the people here, we're really focusing on, on San Diego Community College District. So these will change uh, depending on your district. And we'd love to hear from you maybe at the end about how your district is, is dealing with this too. Um, and I would try to put the, the provisions in the chat here that we just got so basically our priority of assignment, which is if you don't not familiar with it, it's the job security provision of our contract. It's gonna go straight up through December 31st of 2022. So that's great. That means we're not gonna have to worry too much about, um, about losing our job security uh, because of COVID reductions. And that's the basic thing that I wanted to just say. And that's only for San Diego uh, Community College District. So that's all I have to say. Keep going. <laughs> Arnie, we have the health benefits. So the health benefits basically is, is the next agenda item. And we're um, at SDCCD. We had an extension of our health benefits if your classes were reduced and you went, fell below the 50% load that's necessary to, to have health benefits. Those health benefits were extended. That is gonna happen up through September 30th. But as far as I know, there's no plan to extend those past September 30th. So people that have had their classes reduced, your job security will be continued, but your health benefits, um, you may end up losing those health benefits coming, um, September 30th. As far as we can tell, there's no plan to extend those. So uh, just to kind of think about planning for, <laughs> if you have your elective surgeries, get them done before the September 30th. Uh, summer is a really good season to have that catastrophic illness if you can plan it. So um, think about that for you guys, because um, I think a lot of us are going to be losing our health benefits come September 30th. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and yes, and uh, Carlin definitely wanted to remind people that uh, people over 65 should contact Viva and they have an over 65 desk and sign up for Medicare. Um, and as far as we know, the federal COBRA relief is also expiring on the 30th um, also. So it's not gonna work for us. We don't, the COBRA relief is gonna expire on September 30th also. If you're with another district and you had your medical benefits cut, there is a federal relief program for paying COBRA to continue your health benefits. But unfortunately that will also ex um, expire September 30th. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Thank you, and, and and do remember that if you are over 65 and qualify for Medicare, even if you didn't have health benefits through the SDCCD, they have a Medicare plan that you can apply for, which is what I did. So now in retirement, I have better health care than I've had my whole life. So there are some things to look forward to. Uh, the next thing we want to have is the Guild election, and Carol Whaley is going to tell us about that. Okay. Yeah, good. My video started. Uh, my my Zoom froze and kicked me out, and then I was able to get back. I was able to get back in. Um, going back to the to the Medicare and Viva, it's not just SDCCD. If your district uses Viva, you can get that Medicare Viva uh, deal, even if even if you didn't have the health benefits through your district. Okay, so the AFT Guild is uh, in the middle of an election which you may, if you are a part of the AFT Guild, you may or may not know of. AFT Guild uh, represents SDCCD and Grossmont Cuyamaca. Uh, information went out via the USPS to all of the Guild members announcing the election and calling for candidates. It, to my knowledge, was not announced via email to everybody. So I think only, uh, only Guild members got that information. Um, one interesting thing about it, uh, always in the past to run, you had to get the signatures of 10 uh, members in good standing. Well, we're in COVID, we're not working together on campus. You'd think they would have figured out some way to do it where you didn't have to expose yourself to COVID, but no, they kept it. You had to go around and get actual signatures from members, uh, to be able to, uh, to be able to run. So that was a little strange. Ballots are being mailed out either today or tomorrow. So if you are a guild member, look for your ballot to come in the mail and it must be postmarked. There will, there will be a date to be postmarked. Arnie thinks it was, it's May 10th. So it's a kind of a, not a super quick turnaround but a little bit of a quick turnaround. And especially with how the postal service is not the most um, efficient thing right now. Uh, as far as what we know, and, and, and until, the, until the ballots are mailed out to the, to the uh, members, people don't know who's running for what. The only people who know who's, who are running are people who are running, who have asked who are they running against. We do know that Arnie, our, our very own Arnie Schoenberg, is running for City College Adjunct Vice President. Uh, he is running against the current fairly newly appointed adjunct VP, Jessica Thompson. And you may, if you are a guild member, you probably will get a little flyer in the mail from Arnie uh, supporting him. And I believe David wanted to bring a motion. Um, I, Did we, we, could, bring... we could do that now. I was gonna do that during the discussion. Oh, okay. So during the discussion, we'll bring yeah. a motion to officially, yeah. for Sadafa to officially yeah. uh, endorse Arnie but Arnie is Arnie would be would be great he has a lot of he has a lot of experience he's been on the uh on the guild board before uh and uh he would be a great addition to the board absolutely absolutely thank you so much Carol and now we have Helen Wilson from Palomar College who's muted There you Sorry, go. you think I'd, I'd do this daily. You'd think I'd know that. Everybody um, does. <laughs> everybody does it. Uh, I got an uh, email today from Barbara to catch me up on some of the things I didn't know about. And that is that Palomar right now is doing quite a few things for part-time faculty. 
Um, there are new articles up for negotiations where we're fighting for changes that will benefit adjunct faculty. And there is a memorandum of, of understanding that is now working for extra PD hours for part-timers. Uh, increased positions in governance has now happened at um, Palomar. And there's an equity plan for part-timers passed by both the faculty senate and the PFF. Um, and she would be happy to share any extra details on that if anyone at Palomar wants to know. And Palomar has a website uh, that has a, uh, Palomar's union has a website that has a section for part-timers where they give you a lot of different information. So that's an excellent thing to know about. Uh, enrollment was down for Palomar 12% this spring. So that's always a little scary for, um, for uh, part-timers, both uh, uh, in the fall, they're going to be doing both uh, online and face-to-face, -face, but um, most of the lecture classes are going to remain online. And some of the studio classes will go face-to-face, -face, but not all of them. Um, they have just started going out and trying to get people into, the, into your positions with uh, rank. Um, the, the chancellor, uh, for UCN, CSU systems have said that they're going to mandate vaccines. I know most of you know that, but they have suggested that, that the, um, community colleges do the same, that we also, uh, do that. And right now, Miracosta and Palomar are in tandem working on what they're going to do with that, whether they're going to mandate vaccines for face-to-face -face classes and for staff. So that there's no real- Salvador. What? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. And so they're just trying to create a phased in approach for getting people back to face-to-face, -to -face, not doing it too quick, but allowing some people for classes that do better with that. And that is the update that I have at this point. Thank you so much, Helen. That's great. We're, I have to look into Palomar more for what they're doing. They have a lot of part-time faculty in their union leadership. It's quite impressive. Yeah, it's it's fairly new that that has occurred. And um, there's been a lot of stuff that's happened in the, in the discussions with equity. Uh, we've been brought up quite a few times. So that's a good thing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Helen. Our next report is from Grossmont Cuyamaca College. And um, it seems to me that our representative, Salvador Gonzalez, got lost on the way to the meeting. Does anyone see him? No? He's, he's not on right now. I, OK. I All right. Him. Thank you, Arnie. Um, OK, so yesterday we had a meeting, and he gave us a quick update that there's not much news because they are still looking into the um, fall schedule, the board has not decided what they're going to do. So there has been no announcement for face-to-face -face or online teaching. And they're also uh, talking about the vaccine policy, what they're going to have faculty do if they have, require a vaccine or they're, they're not really sure. So his update from Cuyamaca, Grossman Cuyamaca was that it's well, still all up in the air. I'm on a Palomar Zoom listening right now, or whenever it's over, 15 probably. Have fun. What? Shannon, did you want to talk about Palomar? Okay, I guess not, sorry. Okay, um, all right. Um, now we're going to have a, a, a five minute introduction to something very important for everybody, which is salary advancement. And Arnie Schoenberg has put together a program and I think you will enjoy it, Arnie. I wanted to try to combine the um, website presentation and this salary okay. presentation because it's at the same spot. So let's see if I can share screen and get it up here. Um, that looks good. Okay, you, you're all seeing the screen? Yes. Good. So this is our uh, Sadafa website, which is a great tool for a lot of resources and it's a good way to communicate with other adjuncts or part-time faculty in the county. 
Um, it's got a lot of gaps. We're gonna need your help to fill these campus guides with other campus guides. Um, but the resources are nice. There's a lot of stuff in here about unemployment insurance. So please, uh, you know, feel free, take advantage of this and um, use this as your website. So when you want to uh, share your story, um, please do that. I think those, those adjunct stories that we get out there are really nice and it's a quick thing and you can be as anonymous as you want if you have something confidential or you can uh, um, put your name out either way. So I just wanted to give you an example for salary advancement and uh, Linda, we'll take questions at the, at the end really quick. We're almost there, like, like three more minutes. But I wanted to show you this. Now I've set this up for uh, San Diego Community College District, but I'm hoping that we can get some more people to help out and we'll do one for the rest of the colleges in San Diego County. So this is our, our uh, presentation here. And I'm just gonna go through it very quickly. Why now? I think it's because if you are planning your summer activities, it's a really good time um, to make sure that you've done your professional development to get your salary up. And summer's a good time for that. It's coming up. You have some time. You can do these proposals and then you'll end up submitting them in fall. But um, most of this I've learned the hard way by not submitting them, thinking, oh, I'm going to get my uh, PhD and then I won't have to do all this salary advancement. And I delayed this for many years and lost thousands and thousands of dollars. So I would advise trying to do this as soon as possible. You're already being underpaid. Um, and so you might as well try to get as much as you can. So being professional is, is great. And unfortunately we're paid about half the salary of full-time professors. So we're you know, really semi-professionals, I like to say, as an adjunct, as a part-time faculty. Um, so this is it, you know, how do you become more professional in terms of professional development? You just make more money, right? And you can organize, you can you know, take control of the power and get money for education. You could do all that. But you can also do this individual level, which I highly recommend every, everyone to do. Um, please don't be guilty about getting that money. You deserve it. I know a lot of people feel like guilty about that, but no, you really do deserve that money. This is an example uh, from our SDCCD and uh, contract, but it has these things called steps and classes. So it's, it's important to understand the schedule about what is a step in class. And I'm gonna go through this really quick. So a step is gonna be the time you've taught and you're automatically gonna be moved over in terms of your step, but a class you have to do based on one of these petitions. And I, I think a lot of the similar colleges have the same system in place. So the idea of you're gonna get salary advancement by the time you've taught and then also by how much, um, uh, how much professional development you've also done. So here's our, our AFT Guild class and step for the SDCCD. So your class is gonna be based on your degrees and units of degrees. And then your steps are gonna go down based on how many hours you've taught. So to do this, you've gotta have a proposal form and then a completion form. If you've already done the work, you can do this at the same time. So it, you, you can, if you've done work, you can go back and then submit both forms at the same time. Um, you can move over multiple classes. I did that myself. I su submitted a whole bunch of forms and moved over three classes when I finally got around to doing it. So it's a, it's a great thing to do. Um, this is one of the things of where to find these units, where to find professional development that counts. This is gonna depend a lot on your college. I know the city college professional development committee is a lot more lax and flexible about what you can use for units. And the Mesa college professional development committee is very strict. So I don't know why it's just the politics of each college happens to do that, but um, you're gonna find that coursework and get those units and then do this petition, move up in the salary, and then your salary will increase. So it's usually something that has to do with something that's gonna make you a better teacher, some kind of seminar, coursework, um, flex, you can, can't double dip in the sense that when you do flex work and you get flex credit for something, you can't also, um, use that for salary advancement. But if you're like me, you end up doing more flex per semester than you'd ever get paid for. So the stuff that you're not doing, getting paid for, you can then use that even though you've signed up for flex. Um, scholarly creative works, articles, books, um, dance performances, whatever you've done, um, that's all count. And there's some provisions for work experience too. So the way they do is they uh, calculate 
and convert everything in attendance and presentations and seminars and they, they move it in, convert it into units. So it's considered a unit. So 30 hours of attendance or 15 hours of presentation is one unit. That's a lot if you think about it. When you think of a conference, it's, it's gonna take a few conferences for you to get that or one big week long thing to get that unit out of there. But you can build them up. So you can have several conferences over the year or uh, presenting, you get double. It, it adds up and you wanna start keeping track is the main thing that I'm saying now is over the summer, go through your resume, make sure you've got all these uh, line items for each thing you've done, check it over and then see where you're gonna work for applying that to get the salary advancement. Good thing to do this summer. So I'm gonna skip through this because you all know where it is. It's on the sadafa.org website. You can grab this. Um, a couple things I just wanna go through is there's one um, kind of tricky thing about, um, no, I don't wanna go into collective action too much. I think that's about it. I think I'll stop there. There's one little trick that, that's really nice in the SDCCD contract about letting you get credit for undergraduate classes, so often taken out of community college for language classes or computer classes. So you can get salary advancement for undergraduate language classes or computer classes, which are great to take anyway. Learn a new language. It's, it's wonderful, right? So take a, take a language class and you can actually move up the salary schedule in an amazing way. You get six units and then another six units. So you can get up to 12 units of salary advancement from that through this SDC, SDCCD loophole that I, I highly recommend. Anyway, I'd like to stop there. If anyone has any questions, we'll, we'll take it later or feel free to email me um, with any questions you have about that. Thanks. Arnie, thank you so much. Very useful information. Um, that, that's true to some sort in every district, right? As far as I know, but we really need yeah. to finish up those other uh, presentations and those other um, diagrams for the other colleges. So we've right. got a few holes okay. in the website still. Okay, great. Okay, well, we're doing very well. We have, it's 535, we have 25 minutes for discussion. We've covered some issues. People might've brought questions or thought of questions while you were listening. Um, at this point, I think we can just sort of, if you have a question, ask it. And if we get too much of a mess, we can have people raising hands. But um, 